You had a good question about how to find the initial condition x hat of zero. I don't know if you looked at the looked at it some more or thought about it some more. Okay, so um, I looked at the original paper. Uh, the uh, it was a Garamani and Hinton paper, and um, what they do in that paper is to use a form of Coleman filter that runs both forwards and backwards, and and basically. You know, the way we run the Coleman filter is to make predictions about the next state. So we use the state update equation to say that if we know x hat at time n, we can make predictions at time n plus 1, and then we compare it to our observation and we, we change it. We can also write that equation so that given n of plus 1, we can make predictions about n, because basically what we have is that. Um, So we can, we can simply write this equation as x of n is equal to a times um, x, sorry, a minus 1 times x of n plus 1 minus b u of n plus um, um, the noise. And um, in a scenario where you are making predictions about things that are going forward, it's just a common filter. And then if you take the common filter observations and then run it backwards, it's called smoothing. And it was an extension that was made to the common algorithm about 10 years after that paper was published in the 70s. So what Garamani and uh, Hinton do in their paper is they say that get your x hat measurement both first through the common approach and then run it backwards so now you take into account the observation that are you making in the future so you get a little bit better estimate of what x hat is when you do it this way if you have x hat of 1 which we assume we do we also get x hat of 0 because we just run it backwards basically we say that if we have observation made at time point we can make this estimate x of 0 if we know x of 1, which is, we, you know, our assumption is that we have that. And so the mean of the, um, so we, we, we formed a log likelihood, log of the complete likelihood. And then we said that if you look at the log of the complete likelihood, it has a Gaussian that has a center associated with uh, our x hat of time 0. Well, what is x hat of time 0? Well, obviously, the best estimate of that, whatever is going to be, is going to be such that, you know, we set it so that basically it becomes like this, the common filter. So the x of x of time 0 is going to be a minus 1, x hat of time 1. That's the expected value of it. Right. So um, that's the approach. And then to find its variance, you multiply both sides of the equation by the, the top equation by um, uh, x transpose. So you just get expected value of x times x transpose. Yeah, it's called smoothing because you think the backwards prediction. Yeah. Um, no. Um, it, it's smoothing in the sense that in the common filter, what you're doing is you're making a prediction about the future given all the past observation. When you run it backwards, you're making a prediction about now given all the future observations. Does that make sense? So it's just it's smoothing in the sense that it used to, your, your initial prediction depended on all the things in the past. And in engineering, you assume you have all the data. And if you have all the data, then what you do is you just, just run the time backwards. And, and that's just it's called smoothing. Okay, thank you. For that. So, um, so far what we've been doing has been using the state estimation approach and the system identification approach to make estimates of state and make predictions about how our inputs to the world is going to change those states. So when we send an input, it's going to change the state of the system that we're interested in. But all we're doing is making predictions, right? So we're not actually doing anything in the sense that we're not generating a command
to do anything. We're just saying that if such a command was generated, here's what's going to happen. But how do you generate good commands? How do you generate commands that get you things? And in, in the last, I would say, 10, 12 years, there's been thought that, well, in control theory, there's been approaches made to understand how does one control things in the sense that if we want to move you know, a tractor from here to there, if we want to move a rocket from its where it's sitting on the platform to the moon, is there a way for us to generate commands to it in order to achieve something? And in the last 12 years or so, the question has been, does that framework help us understand how the brain controls our movements? And this is the idea that um, there are states that we want to achieve because those are where the rewards or the valuable things are. And then there are actions that you're going to produce that are going to carry certain costs for you. And the question is, what's the optimum behavior? And, and in a sense, in biology, the concept of optimum behavior is something natural because you would sort of imagine that evolutionary things that have happened have made it so that perhaps the way we walk, the way we swim, the way we run, the way we behave is in some way making our fitness best, whatever is the measure of fitness. Um, now, in Darwinian terms, fitness is your ability to live long enough so you can Um, whether that's the only cost is unclear. In engineering, um, what, what has taken place is the concept of describing behavior and control in terms of a cost. And the cost of that is basically, we're going to assume that when you generate an action, it's because you have a goal. You have some goal in mind. You want to make the state of whatever it is that's going to be controlled by your actions so that it reaches some place or some region where things are good. So, you know, you come to class today, you sit here because it's better than being in the rain. This state is better than that state, right? And maybe you also will learn something. So, you made a value judgment about a state. And you said, if I go to the learning theory class today, that's a more valuable state than me going to whatever else was there. Okay. But now the question is, all right, how do I achieve that state? You have to do something to your body, get out of chair, get out of bed, whatever it was the state before for you to come to here. So you carry a cost for that. So here's something you did, and then there is some effort that you have to spend to get to that notion of good. So at the end of the day, when you sit in the class and you've achieved the state after spending a certain amount of energy to get here, the question is, did the way you performed that action, was it as good as it could have been? And this framework of thinking about actions in terms of costs and rewards is the basis for the way we think about some of the ways individuals make movements and the way they make decisions. And the, the, it's a broad framework because it has a potential for us to understand not just how disease affects the way you move, but also is there a link between the diseases and affected, its effect on your movement and also the effect of the diseases and how you make decisions. So for example, um, you may decide that you're going to go to the, say, the pharmacy and you're going to look at the line waiting for people to get their prescription. And when you look at that line, you're going to say to yourself, I think it's going to take me 20 minutes and you're going to make a decision. Is the passage of time worth it for you to wait? Or is there something better to do during that time? So if you, that means that if you have to wait 20 minutes, you're going to miss the beginning of a test in some class, well, you're probably not going to wait. If, on the other hand, you know, nothing's happening today, you are bored as could be, you might as well wait in line to get the prescription. So you made a decision about whether to do this or that. And, you know, our life is full of such decisions. You make decisions about what time to get up, whether you should invest your money in this stock or that stock, whether you should react patiently or impulsively to stimuli around you. And all of this is decisions that consider costs and rewards. And so there's certain costs to doing something in the sense that you're going to invest some effort, 
you're going to invest some money, whatever is the mechanism. And then by doing so, you try to you know, acquire a good state. So in the framework of applying mathematics, what economists, what psychologists, and what control theorists have done is considering control and describing things in terms of mathematical costs. So we're going to do the same. And uh, we're going to show that by thinking about control of simple things, the simplest of all movements, perhaps, in terms of these costs, we can understand why the nervous system moves the way it does. And then ask, well, you know, what does it say about the representation of these costs in our brain? So the typical formulation goes like this. We have a state that is going to be controlled by us. So we have an object here, we have something, maybe our body or something like that. And then it has a state, at, say x is a state, you give it some input u, this changes the state. You make an observation, this is your sensory system, that gives you y. And when you make that observation, you're going to have to now imagine something where it's going to say, all right, this was my observation. Um, and here, what we're going to be talking about is a model that predicts what's going to happen. So this is a model, this was a real model. You're going to combine these, and this is going to give you a posterior, y of n plus 1 given n plus 1. And, and this is going to go into something that's going to be our control. That's going to say, all right, this is the motor command that I'm going to produce next. So, so far, what we've been talking about is essentially this pattern. We've been talking about we have a model of the world, and there's going to be a real world out there. And then you're going to combine these things and you get a common picture or um, something like that. And that's going to give you a poster. This is your estimate happen. This is the estimate of the world now. But the objective remains to generate actions, to do something. Right? So who cares if you can be a good predictor? That just makes you a soothsayer. Right? People will come to you and they will pay you for you to read the tarot cards, the tea leaves, and you can predict the future for them. Right? But you can't actually do anything until you generate the commands you. What we're going to be talking about is the course. This thing and this you. And the idea is as follows. So we're still going to have a system that's going to be really good. Okay. We play with the noise, we make it more complicated, but that's the basic system. But in addition to that, be such that it's going to depend on our actions. So there's going to be some function. So, you know, there's going to be some location, some state where it's going to be more valuable than other states. So for example, you know, when I'm reaching, well, it makes sense for my hand to get to the cup of coffee not out here. So if it gets out here, it's not as good as if it gets to a cup of coffee. So there's some sense of spatial representation of goodness of state. So this g of x is going to be some function of some something good, something It's good to be at that location. Um, this f here is some function of effort. And it's set, you know, as as you generate your commands, it just makes sense to be as lazy as possible. So this function, f of u, is going to be such that it's going to grow in some way, maybe quadratically, maybe in some other way. It's going to grow as a function of u. So it's good to be as lazy as possible. Okay, But we're not quite done with this, um, because uh, we also have to have some concept of time. Why is that? Why is it that it's not enough to 
arrive at a good state with minimum effort. Why is it that we also have some time measure of time? Yeah, because, because if I were to say, I'm going to give you $10 today, and I'm going to ask you, how about if you were to consider $10 today versus $1,000 at the end of the year, which one would you prefer? What's better? Well, there, there, there's a question. $10 today or $1,000 in, in a year? Which one do you want? Yeah. yeah. Most people would take 1000 because $1,000 to them is somehow valued more despite the fact that you have to wait a year. So what am I asking you to do is to think about $1,000 at the end of the year discounted to today. How much, how much does it get discounted? Is it more than 10 If it is, then you would pick that. So let me just show you what I just asked you to do. So the board, the thing that I'm trying to get to, this state is going to have value, right? And so this value isn't constant. It depends on when you get it. So reward. So this is time. Value. This is a subjective value. So when you reach to this cup that has coffee in it, there's a cup at that location. So I have to get to that, right? And there's some effort that I'm going to spend to get there. but. If that cup has value for me, that value is higher if I get there sooner than later. So, this state, I have value, and also a function of time. So in a sense, that the value associated with this function gets discounted the longer it takes for me to get to it. Okay? So, these are the costs that we're going to be talking about. Um, you perform actions to maximize success. You want to achieve success, but it turns out that that success is better if it's than later. That success is not as valuable if you have to you know, bust your back to get it than if you could just walk to it. So effort that you spend is going to discount the amount of success, time is going to discount the amount of success. What we want is to generate the commands U. So what we want to do is to minimize some kind of a cost. We have to end up with what's called a feedback component. So what we want is a policy. And so where does this estimate of state come from? Well, that.
so what eventually what I want to get is as follows. So I'm going to give you a cost. It says here's where the good stuff is. And I want you to produce an action that allows you to get to the good stuff given a cost that has a cost of time and a cost of effort. You're going to find a policy you. By those cost. The constraint equation is the state update equation because that's the thing you control. You're generating actions, it changes the state. So that's the machine that I want you to control. You want to minimize the cost given a constraint. The constraint is the state update equation. The cost is the cost. And at the end, what you're going to end up with is a feedback controller. So what do I mean by feedback controller? A feedback controller is something that doesn't compute all the commands from now to forever. What it does is says, what's your best estimate of where you are? What's your best estimate of x? Where are you? And given this cost that you have, I'm going to now generate the best command that I possibly can to get you there. And then. On the next iteration, it's going to ask you, where are you now? I'm going to generate the best command that you can, so it can get you there. So you have a terminal thing that you want to get to. This idea that, you know, you want to drive to Las Vegas. Where you plan to go there. You start out in Baltimore. You don't plan out the entire trajectory, because who knows? The road may be closed. There may be a bad weather. You may see if, get a call from a friend in Cleveland, ask you to stay. So you have a policy that has a cost. It says, you know, I need to be there at this time. I'm willing to spend this much money. And here's, here's my current plan of how to get there. As you actually drive, you evaluate where you are with respect to where you want to go. And then you change your actions. And that's a feedback control policy. It's similar to you know, life in the sense that you get up in the morning, you ask, OK, what's happening in the near term? What sort of things that are happening today? I'm going to do my actions based on this stuff. But I have this long-term goal of you know, graduating, getting a job, those kinds of things. So your today's actions are sort of vaguely related to this eventual goal, but they're mostly related to the current state that you're in, things that are around you. That's a feedback controller. You don't you know, come to college and plan out four years, six years of life in front of you. you just have some pseudo goal of where you want to go, and then you react to things around you. Okay, so like everything else that we've done in this class, what we're going to focus on are very simple things that we can write mathematically. So you know, we're not going to talk about how to retire in Bahamas. What we're going to talk about is how to move simple systems so that they minimize a cost. But you know, the principle is that. simple mathematical equations that we think can be understood in terms of minimizing this cost. All right. Okay, so that's what we're doing. We're going toward figuring this out. And, and, and the way we're going to figure it out is using what's called the Bellman equation. Bellman equation, so there are two fundamental ideas in this class. One is the Kalman equation. The second is the Bellman equation. The Bellman equation is how we're going to minimize this cost function. And it allows us to solve the feedback control problem. But you know, you guys can go take optimal control class from mechanical engineering, and they will teach you that. So why are you in this class? Because this class is concerned about biology, milk system, things that are be formulated using the same mathematics that you learned in a mechanical engineering class. So we're not going to be talking about just the Bellman equation. What I'm interested in is that how would the brain solve this thing? You know, what, what is the example that it can actually be implemented in anything associated with biology? And so that's the, that's the notion. Any questions? All right, so things are pretty vague, and, and that's the way they are at the beginning, but hopefully we'll fill in the, fill in the parts. So today, what we're going to do is begin the path by talking about how to find the optimum U, but in an open loop control. Open loop. Oh, that's 
spend too much time talking and not enough writing my phone right out. scenario what happens is that we're going to have a cost function single step so we're just going to find the minimum condition that the u that minimizes j but this is going to be done not for some passage of time but for a single condition and so the j that we're considering And we'll see, we'll see how to do that. So it's going to be very simple. There's only going to be one command that will minimize it. Now, to, to do this, um, uh, what I want to show you is uh, data from um, the what happened is that the, uh, the volunteers, humans as well as monkeys were asked to move a joystick. Uh, what I'm talking about is the okay. Today, today's lecture is all of chapter 10. So let me show you the results and then we can this approach and um, find an optimum set of commands to produce the resulting action. So um, if you were to take a muscle So that half the force is produced by A and half the force is produced by B. Okay. 
in the two conditions, what's the difference between these two conditions? Well, if I were to say there's a cost, and that cost is the sum of the squared force being produced by each person, then if I have two people that are each producing half of the force, the square root of 0.5 times 2 is smaller than the square root of 1. Okay, let me write this down. So suppose I have two muscles, F1 and F2. That's equal to 1. You can choose F1 and F2 any way you like. You can make it so that, well, I'm going to say F1 is equal to 1, F2 is equal to 0. Now, let's say I had a cost. And that cost was F1 squared plus F2 squared. So in this case, my cost is 1. Right? I could also have a scenario where F1 is 0.5, F2 is 0.5. This is fine, right? In both conditions, I can produce a force of 1. Now, in this case, the cost is 0.5 squared plus 0.5 squared, which is what? What is this? 0.5. So this policy costs less than this policy. Because what did I do? I shared my activity among the various actors, right? So, a tuning function, we're going to see, is sharing. And when we have a cost function that is squared like this, sum of fi to the m, where m is equal to 2, it generates policies that are saying, share things between people. Because it's going to cost you a lot to have a winner take all. And the larger this M is, the more sharing is going to take place. As M approaches 1, then you get winner take all. Right? So in this case, M is equal to 1. It just, I'm going to, if, if, if it doesn't matter to me, so if, if, if my cost is this, and m is equal to 1, so j is equal to sum of fi to the power of 1, then this cost is the same here as it is here. It makes, it makes no difference. This policy is not better than this. This policy is not better than this if m is equal to 1. But this policy is better than this if m is equal to so by penalizing effort to the power of 2, you are imposing a sharing policy so that there, there's not going to be a winner take all. Everybody's going to pitch in. OK, all right, so let me show you a couple questions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so is M the parameter we're trying to find? Yeah, I'm going to show you that in with actual data, if we just have a model that says we have um, the goal force to produce, we can biologically measure the various pointing directions, the, the uh, pulling directions of the muscles, and we want to say, okay, how does the nervous system allocate activity to the muscles? Okay. Well, let's find the M. And also, are we assuming those tuning functions are symmetric? Well, or is it doesn't we matter? We make no assumptions about their shape. Okay. We're going to see. We're going to say that for the M that you choose, what is the tuning? And in fact, we're going to see they're asymmetric because it, it really depends on this distribution here. So if this distribution is weird like this, and so most of the things are over to the left, right. they will not be symmetric. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So um, right. So we have force. force that's going to produce is the activation times this vector that's going to tell me the pulling direction. So this is just a, this is a 2 by 1, this is a 2 by 1, and this is a scale. Now, what we have is that we have set of activations u, which is just u1 to un, so how many muscles we have. And then we have a matrix p, which is p1 to 
And so we can write the um, total force that the, the system is producing, F, as P times G. So now what we're going to do is we're going to say we're going to have a cost, and um, that cost is the difference between the goal force minus what you did analyzed in a simple way. Um, so you know you want to generate your forces so that you, you, you arrive at this, full, this goal that you want. And you want to do it as, um, with least effort as possible. To generate the commands so that you produce the goal, activate these muscles so that they generate the force, the total force that you want, but do it in such a way that we're going to penalize the motor commands that you produce by a cost that depends on you and a power that depends on him. And all I want to show you is that, well, you know, how do we minimize this cost? One and two. Um, what does the result look like depending on depending on the shape of M? What is this this M function? So um, it turns out that uh, if you look at what M is doing. As I've described for you here, is that it is basically imposing a cost that, if u becomes large for one particular muscle, it's going to cost you a lot. So what what this does is that it makes it so that when when m is equal to two, what we get is a scenario where um, uh, the preferred direction pi angle of pi is going to be at some location, we're going to see the activity for that muscle tends to be maximum in that direction and fall. When m is equal to, this m is equal to 2, when m is equal to something less than 2, it's going to look like this. It's going to become narrow. Like this. And it, the smaller m becomes, the narrower that becomes. As m gets larger than 2, it becomes more. Falls down more slowly. And uh, now, this is a you know, this is nonlinear stuff here, so that you would have to be a search mechanism where you would find that you I wouldn't be able to write this write the equation for you. You just simply have to search it in the space to find the u that minimizes that. But the effect of parameter parametrically uh, um, penalizing commands is that you get sharing, you get greater sharing when the um, uh, uh, penalty is large and you get less sharing when it takes all when the penalty is small. I should have, um, uh, I should have, uh, this, is, this is not quite right, um, the peak becomes larger um, as the, uh, so it's, it's like a distribution, I didn't draw it right, the peak grows larger as the, uh, as the width becomes smaller, the integral So this is really the beginnings of the idea that um, by looking at real behavior, measuring activity, we can potentially arrive at these cost functions. Now, when this paper was published, this paper was, um, I think it was 2004 or something like that, where they measured this activity and, and they, uh, they said that look, one can describe a, a, a cost function that, that seems to uh, predict it. Um, the problem with it was as follows, and I want to I describe it to you because it is not the case that we can write such an equation. So really what we have is we have force in the muscle is equal to ui times pi, but there's also noise associated with this force. where phi i is a random variable with mean 0 and variance 1. So what did I write? 
I wrote that the force that the muscle produces depends on its activation, but also depends on a random variable that is being um, multiplied by something that has a gain of ki. And um, what, what that means is that the variance of this force, so what's the mean of this? So the expected value of fi is just ui pi, but variance of fi is equal to ui squared ki squared times pi pi transpose. So what this says is that the variance of my force depends on the input u. But what this means is that as u increases, the variance of force is going to quadratically increase. Some function that's going to, that's going to increase. Because you notice that the relationship between variance and u depends on the square root of u. Okay, so why is that important? Because if force depends on not just the input, but also the noise associated with the, the way that input generates force, then our cost function is not a um, uh, uh, deterministic value. It's a, it's, a, it's a random value. So what we need to do is minimize not j, but what we need to do is minimize the expected value of j. So what I want to show you is that if you have a system that has this kind of noise, this kind of noise is called signal dependent. Signal dependent noise arises in biological systems. And what that means is that if you look at force, time, and you ask someone to produce some amount of force like this, you get a little bit of wiggle. As the force increases, you get more wiggle, and then you get more wiggle here. So you notice that the variance of the signal is changing as a function of the mean. Right? So that's a critical idea. Very important to know what the noise structure is because, as you remember, when we were doing the common filter, we assumed that the noise structure was Gaussian, a mean that was independent of its variance. Here, we're dealing with systems that have a mean, but a variance that depends on the mean. That's the way most realistic systems work. So, what's the consequence of this? Well, the consequence of this is that we're going to see that in our cost function, when we find the expected value of the cost, we are naturally squaring the u as a component of our cost. Meaning that just by trying to be at the target, produce the force that you want me to do, if I want to represent the expected value of that force, I am penalizing the squared force. And why I'm doing that is because when I want to find the expected value of something that says be accurate, which is what this is, be accurate, if I have commands that increase the variance of my force, the larger these commands are, the less accurate I'm going to be. So effectively, I'm going to have an equation that's going to have squared um, uh, penalty associated with my motor commands. So, so let me show you. equal to the 
expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x squared. So therefore, expected value of x squared is going to be the variance of x plus the mean of x squared. So what if you have expected value of scalar quantity x transpose x? So this is a scalar quantity. And the reason why it's important for us to consider is because this quantity here, j, is also a scalar quantity and it's going to have random variables u that are going to be multiplied by themselves. So this is going to be a useful um, thing for us to consider. So uh, all right, how do we how do we approach this? Um, The variance of x is uh, expected value of x x transpose minus expected value of x expected value of x transpose. So This quantity here oh, sorry, I need to let me, let, me write, let me take one more step here. So um, this quantity, expected value of x transpose x. X transpose x is a uh, scalar quantity which is also the same as the trace of x x transpose. This is just the uh, expected value of x transpose expected value of x. So this is our solution, expected value of x, x transpose, oh, I'm sorry, x transpose x, our scalar quantity is the mean plus the trace of the variance. We have a term of expected value of x transpose ax here, some matrix in between, then that's going to be equal to the trace of A of, of the variance of ax plus the expected value of x transpose.
very important equations for us because we're going to be using this a lot um, because what we're going to be doing is find the expected value of that j and to do so we're going to have to find the derivatives with respect to u which means we're going to have to be able to expand it to uh, So let's go back to our basic problem and minimize our equation. set up the problem and find, uh, find our solution. So I have the following cost that I want to minimize. Um, I have a cost that says minimize force or difference between the goal and um, the individual forces that are produced by the various muscles. Suppose we have a very simple cost like this. And um, individual forces at phi are um, equal to ui pi expected value of j, so the expected value of j is going to be, um, I have a scalar quantity, it's going to be the expected value is ui squared ki squared pi pi transpose. Which, uh, this trace here is just going to be the sum of ui squared ki squared pi transpose. So the objective was here to for me to show you that I started with this cost function and all it says is that find the, the commands that sum together to 
produce the gold, and the closer you are to the gold, the better. But if the forces that I generate are signal dependent, then the commands UI are going to be such that they minimize the cost in which I generate forces that I get as close as possible to the goal, and I am minimizing another cost that's associated with the square order cost. Yeah. How do we, inside the trace, um, go from the variance of f g minus sum of f i to this, that that's so? trace the sum? Yeah. Um, well, the only random variable is f i, the sum of f i. And they're independent. Yeah. OK. Right, because the noises here are phi i's, but they're independent. Yeah. OK. OK. So if you have a signal dependent noise in your system, by trying to measure, by trying to reduce the cost associated with bringing your, you know, the sum of action to the goal, you are implicitly minimizing a cost that says activate your things as small as possible. It's a squared cost that you have. So the expected value of J includes accuracy plus effort. Does that make sense? So, one of my former students, Jorn Dietrichsen, um, after he got his faculty position in uh, University of College London, um, did a neat experiment to test whether one could come up with this J in the way individuals control the force in each limb. And here's what he did. He said, take two fingers, left hand and right hand, and push on a force transducer. So, you're going to have a force transducer on the left, force transducer on the right, you're going to generate some force on the left. You're going to generate some force on the right. And what matters is the displacement of a cursor, x, that depends on ul plus ur. So your goal is to displace this cursor. And you can do it by pushing all the way with your left hand, or pushing all the way with your right hand, or the sum of the two, however you want. And you just solve this problem. How much force do you produce with your left and the right hand? And what's nice is that. You know, some finger, like our index finger, is going to have probably low noise, whereas you know, our, this little finger may have a lot of noise, maybe because we're not so good at controlling it. And so K is going to differ for different fingers. That, that signal dependent noise term on the FI there. And you wanted to know, and, and maybe also if you're right handed, maybe the noise would be different on your right hand than your left hand. So you wanted to know when you are splitting this force between your right and your left hand, what's the policy that you're using? How are you, how are you solving this problem? So let me show you the approach. So what we have is um, xi, uh, uh, cursor displacement that is produced by input u left or right, um, is going to be a normal with mean ui. So let me XL with a uh, variance that depends on um, KL squared UL squared. So displacement of cursor by left finger UL. sense of what this means. What this means is that if you were to look at the standard deviation of force as a function of force, you would have a slope that would be k. So the standard deviation of the noise grows as a function of the mean of the noise. It's the expected value of force. And the slope is k. So the variance is quadratic, the standard deviation is So the, the optimal control problem is as follows. What we want to do is um, 
minimize the difference between the displacement and some goal. So the expected value of this is what we want to minimize. Argument. Find the U that minimizes this uh, uh, expected value. U star is what we want, and we want to minimize this expected value. So just before, before I do it, it's going to be very simple. But I just want to step back a little bit so that we have a sense of what's going on now. So um, these, con these control problems that we're considering have very simple relationships between input U and some force. Right. So there is no dynamics in the sense of what we're going to be going toward. So right now, we just have this very simple relationship, action, consequence. In the real system, action has dynamics. So when you generate U, there's a dynamical system that has a hidden state X that gets translated in time. Right. So we're not considering that. We're just considering U generates a force, and that force is going to have some variance. So it's, 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 it's an open loop one single time step scenario that we're considering. Right. All right, so we want to minimize this, uh, this cost. What is this cost? The cost is the difference between what our cursor does and where the goal is. X left plus X right, so the displacement cost on the cursor by the left and right forces that we're producing should be such that we get us close to the target as possible. So um, okay, how to do that? Well, you want to find the expected value of that random variable. So the expected value of J is going to be equal to the expected value of XL plus XR minus G quantity squared plus the trace the variance of XL plus XR minus G. What is XL and XR? These are our random variables. So the expected value of this is going to be UL plus UR minus G squared. And then the second term here is going to be trace variance of this, variance of XL is going to be KL squared UL squared variance of XR KR squared UR squared and uh, trace here is meaningless because it's a scalar variables. So I'm just going to get rid of these. Okay. So um, now I find the optimum Command. So let's find the derivative of this with respect to UL. I get 2 UL plus UR minus G um, plus 2 KL squared UL. I set that equal to 0. And what I get is um, 2 UL plus 2. And similarly, we can find the UR. The command for the left hand, the command for the right hand is going to be G minus UL, 1 plus K R squared. So what we just did is that we said, you have a goal for us to produce. You should produce it in such a way that it depends on the noise. And now what I can do is I can take UR, here's the, here's the equation for UR, this is the optimal U, the star on it. And I can take this and put it in here and solve for UL, and what I get is the following. Um, UL star divided by UL star plus UR star is equal to KL squared KR squared. So, what is this 
me. It says that, um, the larger the noise associated with your right finger, the larger should be the force produced by the left hand. So, you know, if you have two fingers, one is really noisy, you should give more command to the other. That's what, that's what the other equation says. So, if we have such a cost function where all that matters is to generate a force so we get as close as possible to the target and we want to minimize the expected value, then the activation, the amount of force we produce with each finger should be related to the noise in each finger. That was the theoretical prediction. Okay? So, Jorn measured the noise in the right finger. He asked the, the, the subject to produce force one, force two, force three, force four at different levels. So, he measured K for different amounts of force. He asked them to produce a different amounts of force and measure the standard deviation of force, he fitted this K and found the noise for the left finger, for the right finger. Does that make sense? In isometric class. Then what he did is then he said, okay, so now you're given a chance to activate each muscle however you want, each finger however you want. And do you produce force on your left hand and right hand in such a way that minimizes a cost that depends on these noises. Do you allocate each finger that this value? And he found the answer was good. It wasn't as simple as that. So then he said, all right, what else is going on? It's not just these noises that matter. It's not just that cost. So he said, all right, what if I add to this another kind of a cost? So this is the cost that he started with. Let's say put a cost that has a weight lambda one on it. Then he said, let's add another one, lambda two, in which we explicitly are going to penalize effort. So what we're going to have is that we have these u's in there. So we're going to have ul squared plus ur squared. So this penalizes effort in a particular way. See that? It, 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 sorry. It penalizes effort by the, uh, the amount of noise in each one. Right? So what if we just penalize effort independent of the noise. That's what the second term does. And then he added a third term that said, well, really, what these use, what they really are, matter isn't just by themselves. What they matter is with respect to the maximum voluntary u. L squared plus ur squared maximum voluntary ur. So force by itself maybe doesn't matter so much. Maybe what matters is how much force that finger can produce maximally. So not an absolute value of force, but we relative to its maximum voluntary force. So he fitted a function that looked like this. And then he was able to explain the results very well. So he seemed like really what mattered was not just noise, but also the effort that is being spent, not in terms of absolute value of the force, but in terms of how did that force compare to the maximum force that the, that the muscle could produce. And then the things work well. Yeah. That would look like the noise doesn't matter at all. That's yeah, in fact, in this case, it looked like the noise didn't matter that much. The, what really mattered was the effort, the, the U, the U term, normalized the maximum voluntary force. Is the maximum voluntary force proportional to the noise? Like I think about my pinky, which is noisiest, is also weakest. Right, right. No. Uh, I don't know if there was any relationship between K and MVF. Usually, um, noise has not to do with the size of the muscle. It has to do with the neural control of that muscle, meaning that how much brain space do you have allocated for that. Um, so uh, you, know, you may have a very delicate muscle that you can really control well, or you can have an opposite. It just depends on what you use it for. So I think. Um, our thumb, for example, may produce a huge amount of force, but I don't know if we have good control over it. I don't know if noise is associated with it. Yeah, it's because like our vocal cords are very precise. Yes, yeah. uh, very small. Very small. Yeah. Yeah. So that that has to do with use, right? And how how well we practice. Okay. So
and then he, he measured these and, and he came up with some estimates of these lambdas. And with a scenario where force was normalized to maximum voluntary force, he got a good fit. Any questions? So just to summarize the basic ideas, what we're moving toward is thinking about control of action in terms of having a cost function. And this cost function, so far we've been describing it in terms of having a effort cost and some, something that says the state that you want to arrive at has some distance away from where you are. So it's good to be at a particular state. And you have to find the commands that provide you And eventually, we're going to add a cost of time to it so that we want to get there as quickly as possible while minimizing the effort. And uh, to do so, first we're going to describe this Bellman equation, and then uh, we're going to compare it to uh, biologically realistic things like time and things like that. Okay, see you Wednesday.